Good afternoon, and, and thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, my name is Chris Fate, and with me I have Dr. Sahani, Dr. Mandeep Sahani, and Ron Cubitt. Um, we look forward to speaking with you today on, you know, the the industry of telehealth and how it can be used and implemented and leveraged to support rural communities. As an overview, you know, the telehealth industry has advanced and grown significantly over the past three to five years. Um, you know, prior to 2019, the telemedicine industry was, you know, a $41.6 billion um, industry. Um, with that growing significantly, um, largely in light of, you know, the reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and currently is valued at a $79.79 billion industry. Um, and further growth is projected, you know, through, through, through COVID, we were able to identify um, its place and kind of really ramp up its utilization, both with providers and patients across the country. Um, it's estimated by 2027 that the industry might be as high as a $400 billion industry. You know, and Ron, I know you've been working in the space for, for a long time as well. And, you know, there's been a lot of transactional activity in the space, um, even in the last year or so. Um, right. I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that. Sure. You have, you know, American Well, which is Amwell today. You have SOC Telemed. You have Teladoc. Uh, they've all gone either IPO, they've done mergers and acquisitions and things like that as well. It's interesting when you look at their 10K, a lot of them are still losing money and it'll be interesting. You also have Cigna that's looking at MD Live right now. And the, the news that was out just last week is that you're having Amazon and you're also having Optum, which just stated that they are going into all 50 states. So telehealth is not gonna go away. Uh, the landscape might be changing in the future. And, you know, some of the issues that we have talked about is, you know, parity from a standpoint of being paid and things like that. But, you know, people are coming in and people are enjoying it. I mean, Dr. Sahani, you've been utilizing it for a while. What's your experience? Uh, firstly, th thank you, everybody, for giving me the opportunity to be on this uh, symposium today. Uh, thanks, Chris, and thanks, Ron. Uh, yes, uh, we actually got into telenephrology, uh, acute telenephrology, which is hospital-based telenephrology, a year prior to COVID. Uh, it was a leap of faith, and this is in a rural hospital in, in Arizona. Uh, we looked at all the other conventional models. It was uh, prohibitively expensive, and we decided to take an alternate route and try and do it low-key, low expense, and, and, and using uh, low-end technology we floated the program back in June 2019. COVID came, we were actually prepared. We had a significant experience. Uh, we scaled that program and added another program uh, also in, in rural communities. So uh, we've had uh, significant success in uh, getting this program, uh, mostly uh, telenephrology into the rural communities and being able to be present uh, in the middle uh, of COVID through, through the entirety of COVID, especially when there were no beds available in, in uh, most of uh, Phoenix. So uh, in, in every respect, which I'm happy to share uh, in, in the symposium, uh, this has been a tremendous benefit to the community. That's interesting, Dr. Sahani, you know, um, it would be great to get your take on kind of what you're seeing, you know, even prior to COVID and, and what you're seeing now, both from the patient uh, adoption and physician provider adoption. You know, I think one study I saw that, that was done in 2019, which sounds like when you guys were probably just ramping and starting your program, you know, only like 11% of the patient population had a desire to use telemedicine. And, and I think the rural communities might be a different story than the broader population because sometimes it's the only access they have to care. Um, but, you know, in 2020, you know, the end of 2020, that same survey, they, you know, they were able to identify that 75% of the population that they um, interviewed is open and excited about using a digital platform, digital health to get their healthcare services. Did you, do you see, you know, from the, you know, the start of when you as in your practice started doing, virtual care to now a, a, a significant difference between your patients? Absolutely, Chris. I, that's actually a great question. You know, as I say, uh, 
uh, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So that's exactly uh, what we found uh, when, when COVID came and the fact that the, our offices were being closed, uh, outpatient medicine had become scarce, uh, people didn't know what to do exactly, what protocols to follow. Uh, every day we were getting a different uh, directions from the CDC, but uh, telemedicine, I think, saved us all. Uh, so our program, which we had started back in 2019, was, uh, like you mentioned, Chris, in, in rural America, in rural Arizona, uh, and that was a hospital-based program, and, and this was a new service to the community and to the hospital. So the adoption and the acceptance of that uh, a service was very heartily received. Uh, and you're right, uh, we, we tried to do uh, telemedicine as an outpatient uh, in, in that community that didn't go so well, because uh, I think the patients were, were used to seeing a provider face to face. And, and back in uh, 2019, they kind of wished that they would continue doing that. But 2020 came, uh, it was a, a rapid shift to an, an, an alternative. Since we already were in this space, in, in the telenef space, it became easier for us to, to transition. And you're right, it, uh, patients loved it. They said, you know, we don't have to drive to come and see you. Uh, I can be at home with my family. We can, we can bring in other family members who are, you know, living in different states uh, all at the same time. People can zoom in, uh, no, no pun intended there. But, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, it just, it just took off. Uh, uh, and even now, even in Arizona, as the incident rates of, of COVID is declining, uh, patients who have adjusted to telenephrology uh, in, the, in the outpatient setting uh, still uh, continue to, to, to follow that service. Yeah. And do you find that, I mean, when you started the, your practice and the virtual practice, did you have partners that were hesitant or reluctant to want to adopt the technology, you know, just in my practice, you know, the last six or seven years, and I work primarily in the compliance world as well as kind of the operation side, but, um, you know, there was always kind of a hold up with kind of a cohort of physicians that didn't think they'd be able to provide the same level of care and things of that nature. And, you know, adoption amongst um, physicians was relatively low. Do you, do you find that to, to have been um, at least any of their anxieties um, lesser now that um, they've been using it and kind of forced to use it because of COVID. Exactly right, Chris. I think COVID is, ha has changed uh, everyone's uh, uh, adoptability rate, everyone's uh, user experience. Uh, I, I think if it wasn't through COVID, like you mentioned earlier, we would see a, a slow adoption to uh, telemedicine. COVID just forced us into, into warp speed, uh, if you will, and, and got everyone as, uh, adjust to telemedicine as fast as they could. I think the initial barrier was trying to scramble and see what technology we could use. But once you know, we, we were given the waiver uh, uh, of, of HIPAA, from HIPAA, that we could use uh, technology that, that's conventional and in use, I think that also hastened the adoption. Yeah, so, uh, and we'll dive into that quite a bit here in a little bit, talking about the barriers breaking down and, and, and those things. What, you know, I found an interesting statistic as I was doing some research and, you know, nearly in 2020, nearly half of, and this is a primary care practice. Again, it's not necessarily telenephrology or anything like that, but nearly half of, you know, the Medicare fee for service activity in 2020 came from virtual visits, um, which is mind boggling. Cause I think in 2005, it might've been $17,000 worth of uh, Medicare activity related to telemedicine activity. So it's, it's, it's kind of mind boggling. Wow. You know, and I think the, you know, the other interesting, you know, aspect, and, and I think this probably hits to the consumer, the patient even more so, but you know, the complementary technology that's being advanced. Um, and you'd mentioned it used to be so expensive to do these things. Um, but as, as companies are starting to compete and get, get more kind of familiar with technology and introduction of artificial intelligence and other complementary um, resources that can be layered with or on top of telemedicine. You know, I think that's gonna be kind of a game changer. I, I agree with you, Chris, uh, totally. I think uh, the, the, the technology side, we already seen that being uh, commoditized. I think where you can be creative in delivering the service, uh, that's gonna be the key moving forward. Yep. And there was a, a recent survey performed by, you know, the American Telemedicine Association or study rather, not a survey, but 
um, you know, showed a really strong correlation between kind of hospital performance and adoption of telehealth strategies, um, not only from a quality perspective, but um, even um, kind of patient satisfaction and, and quality improvement scores. Um, and they kind of partnered up with IBM Watson to do that. So it, it's an interesting story is we're forced to get more activity in this space we're able to have quicker access to results, whereas it was slowly adopted before um, and had less case studies. And you know, now again, because of COVID, we're able to have access to research um, and statistics to, to show these improvements. Exactly. Uh, so, sorry, Ron, I just want to add a quick point. And you mentioned uh, patient satisfaction scores, right? So from, from, from my experience, uh, I think it's, uh, it's from what I can see uh, the reaction from the patient's faces. It's something novel to be on camera, right? And they would start sharing uh, their, 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 their medical history in a more elaborate manner than I think they would if I were present in the room with them. I think it, it gives them the, uh, the, the patients gives them the feeling that the, the lights are on them. You know, the, the focus is, is just on them. And there are no distractions, which for me, as 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 a provider, in order to get to gain that data uh, from the patient becomes really really easy. I'm sorry to cut you off, Ron. I just want no, to get. No. All good. You know, and I think we touched on these a bit, and we're going to dive into these in some you know good detail here in a little while. But you know, these are what what folks have always identified as. Um, kind of a, a barrier to entry into the space, you know, physician licensing, credentialing, reimbursement, and I would say largely, um, you know, Medicare, um, especially in nephrology, um, and awareness and adop in the adoption. Um, as we talked earlier, I, you know, I think we're getting significant headway on awareness and adoption. Um, similarly, I think reimbursement, you know, anytime kind of Medicare does anything, it, it has a significant impact to how providers and patients act and behave. And even before COVID, you saw a lot of the writing on the wall about improved reimbursement, you know, you know removing some of the geographic re restriction um, issues and things like that. Um, you know, I think physician licensing is an interesting one, and Dr. Shani would love to get your perspective on it. Um, you know, I think that's one of the things that, you know, COVID opened the floodgates for. You know, a lot of state, wa state waivers on state licensing requirements or, you know, getting um, kind of by proxy um, licensing. And I know there are some initiatives out there, and I think you're very familiar with one. It's the, you know, the Federation of the State Medical Board's Interstate Licensing Compact. Um, and that's been in the works even prior to COVID. Um, but would love to get your thoughts on that, kind of how, I know you're, you're located in Arizona. You do a lot of kind of both your private practice in Arizona, but you're venturing out into other, other states and kind of talk about some of those issues that you're seeing. Yeah, yeah, sure. So as, as relates to the, uh, uh, licensing, uh, Chris, uh, I think pre-COVID as well, like you mentioned, on, on, the, on the compact license, it was a little, it was easier. COVID opened the floodgates, as you mentioned, and, and what, what would normally take about three to six months just to get a response from them. It was getting, it was taking about three, to, sometimes three to five days and maximum about 10 days. So I think everyone understood the need uh, to get more providers on board in communities where COVID was, you know, hitting a surge and other communities COVID probably wasn't or was, was on the decline temporarily. The ability to get and speed up uh, licensing for physicians made a significant uh, impact for us. So I was able to, to get licensed in, in, in New Mexico initially at, on a temporary basis, a provisional basis, and then they extended that to a full license once I submitted my fingerprint and a background check. But the, uh, the, the entire process has been really, really smoothened out. Yeah. And I think credentialing, that's more of a speed bump than kind of a barrier sometimes. I think that's more, again, going through kind of working with your hospital partner if, if it's a hospital-based model and, and getting that credentialing. But it's still kind of that paperwork that has to be filled out before you can probably, you know, go live with anything. 
Um, reimbursement, as we talked about, is, is a large one. Um, you know, I'm not sure what your kind of exper experiences with the private payers and, and things of that nature, but I know there's been significant parity um, improvement the last couple of years. I think 29 states reimburse somewhat for telemedicine. I know it's going to be fairly limited state by state what kind of they're requiring of the private you know, payers to do. Um, but as I think you spoke about earlier is, I mean, nearly all of the five big insurers across the country, Aetna, Cigna, Blue Cross, Humana United, they're all offering um, telemedicine. And, and just from my personal experience and, and knowing benefit design, I'm, they're really pushing it. Um, they would prefer you to use, you know, their digital health partner, whether it's a Teladoc or an Amwell um, or something of that nature. So I think it's very interesting to see. That makes total sense, uh, Chris. I think even for a payer, the, you know, the, 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 if I were a payer, my main concern would be getting my members access to care. This only speeds that. I mean, it makes it uh, ubiquitous that at just a click of a button, I can get access as a, as a consumer to either my specialist or my, my, my primary care doctor. And maybe I can get my specialist and primary care doctor on the same time and take care of my chronic problems. I think that is, has significant, significant value to payers. And I think we're just starting just to see uh, this, the, the second or third iteration of, of telemedicine as you, as you can able to get on a, on a chronic disease platform, if you will, and, and, and imagine, imagine a scenario where, uh, and this is most of, or majority of my patients, they don't have one diagnosis. They have three, four, five diagnoses. In a month, they see a cardiologist, they see a pulmonologist, they see uh, an endocrinologist, and they have to see the primary care physician. Mm -hmm. and, and very often there is a uh, delay in, in communication between the specialists. And, and very often it is the, the uh, by default, the responsibility of the patient to translate to the respective physicians what has transpired during his visit with the previous physician. So imagine a scenario where through telemedicine, you can get that patient's, all his providers, you know, on, on one day, one platform at the same time, they communicate, a patient could be at home or could be at his PCP office and, and uh, you know, get the notes done and, and just seamless uh, ability to communicate and, and translate, uh, you know, and, and at the end of the day, deliver effective care to the patient. And, and, yeah. and of course, the patient then doesn't have to, you know, make all these visits to, to these, these providers and uh, just a one-stop shop. So I think we, we will continue to see as the uh, influence of uh, telemedicine unfolds. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's, it's always been interesting, especially in kind of a rural setting. One, I think Medicare has always had, um, or at least for the, recent future had the, you know, for rural communities, the geographic restriction that, that made it appropriate to do care there. Um, regardless, people were kind of hesitant for, because they might not get reimbursed as much or, um, you know, concerned about that reimbursement environment. But from a contracting perspective, but, you know, you know, to, to get a service to provide to your community, you know, you've always been able to do that through traditional contracting mechanisms, you know, so you know, reassignment of collections, or if it's a service that need, is a need for the community that can not only improve health, but, you know, the financial performance of the organization, you can enter into contracts to, to provide those services so long as they're compliant with the regulatory rules and guidelines. But I've always thought that was, you know, always an alternative that maybe was spoken less about. Right. Very true. You know, we, we talked about this more high level earlier, but, you know, COVID really kind of started to open the door, really started to highlight, you know, the, what I feel is the government's broader acceptance of this as a modality, um, which I know we're going to talk a lot, a lot more about later, Ron, is, you know, it's a modality. It's not like a change in the way you're delivering care, but, um, you know, they went as far as making, oh, excuse me, home, the home appropriate site. Um, you know, open the, the, the gates on kind of the reimbursable codes, you know, previously um, the reimbursable codes for telemedicine were fairly limited. Um, I would say, you know, and Dr. Sahani, you probably have a little bit more perspective on this, but for nephrology, you know, they've been a little bit more open to the codes, you know, chronic care management, 
Um, I even think some of the more um, mandatory and voluntary reimbursement models that have come out um, in the past two years, you know, it encourages the use of telemedicine even prior to COVID. Um, so I think, you know, it's one step at a time you're seeing, um, especially for these, these patient populations that, you know, for all intents and purposes are, have been underserved. And this can provide a vehicle for them to get services as well as education um, and improve life, lifestyle. Um, you know, I think the government has shown those signs even before COVID. Um, and then post COVID, it's um, even more open. So. You know, getting back to kind of the targeted discussion on, um, you know, it's, it's my, my feeling and belief is, uh, you know, telemedicine has always been a tool that was intended to really benefit the rural communities. Uh, you know, if you look back at the roots of when it became more of an effective strategy, um, you know, NASA and the Nebraska Psychological Institute in 1960 and 1970 used it to provide care to rural communities. The, you know, the NASA portion was more of a pilot study and understand that was probably intended to support their delivery of care for their astronauts in space. But, um, you know, the Indian Health Services Organization has always been um, kind of a big use, utilizer of these services in, in the rural community. So you look at Nebraska, you know, I think they started, you know, doing rural inpatient psychiatric evaluations um, even in the 70s. So, you know, I think it's really been a targeted resource to expand care to patients in underserved communities. Um, and, and I think we'll continue to do that, um, especially as you know, our technology and access to technology improves in those communities, you know, going as far as, you know, 4G and 5G networks and access to internet resources. Um, I think it's becoming more and more a realistic delivery model. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I think this is a broad stroke, but most community, rural communities have a limited supply of providers. Um, and I would argue, and you could probably speak to this even more so, Dr. Sahani, but for nephrologists, it's even worse um, because the pool's getting smaller and smaller um, for fellows and, and those physicians that want to be trained as nephrologists. Exactly right, uh, Ron. We're, we're, we're a, a dying breed, if you will, uh, most the, many of our senior colleagues are retiring uh, year after year, and and it's not a sought out specialty anymore as it was uh, a, f a few years ago. So you're right, and and as the burden of uh, chronic kidney disease and dialysis ESRD increases, we are going to have to use technology to be able to deliver in, in remote areas and be able to get so the patient can get access to care as if there was you know somebody present there physically. Mm -hmm. Are you finding, and I think it might be a little different now because most groups utilize it, um, I've always been curious for our, you know, new fellows or, or younger physicians that are coming in who um, traditionally the argument is, is are more amenable to adopting technology, EMRs and, and things of that nature just because they weren't implemented um, later in their practice. Are you finding kind of in your interaction with your colleagues across the country that the younger physicians are, you know, hoping to have this and it could potentially be a recruitment opportunity for you and your groups? Exactly right, Chris. And actually we have uh, started using this as a recruitment uh, strategy. In fact, so if, if you have uh, nephrologists who have worked post fellowship for a couple of years, uh, and and still have some access back to their community where before they come to Arizona, we say, hey, you can continue to see your patients if, they, if they're willing to see you via telemedicine. Mm -hmm. So it, it enhances the, in a way, uh, the continue of care. Uh, patients in, in these remote areas are able to continue to see their nephrologist of choice, but now via a different medium. Mm -hmm. And then even so, I mean, creates group efficiencies, you know, depending on how it's set up to, you know, help support rural communities that have no providers or just one provider. So. Exactly right. 
you know, kind of, you know, getting back to more of kind of that operational lens of implementing telehealth strategies in rural communities. You know, I think it's, it's important to kind of understand what you're getting into and what you need to do. Um, and what is it that you're exactly looking to provide, right? So, you know, a hospital-based consultation service I think versus a direct to patient or direct to consumer model where you're kind of either the traditional direct to consumer is, you know, app, an application on your phone or, or something like that. But even, you know, a home model, um, I would say, um, which could be prevalent in nephrology or any kind of primary care setting for, you know, remote, remote patient monitoring and things of that nature, you know, they have, they each have their own hurdles that you have to get through from an operational legal compliance standpoint. Um, and it's important to understand that going into it, you know, um, you know, I think you need to understand, you know, those limitations because they're going to be different for both of those models than, um, you know, just a, you know, a hospital based service. So, you know, stepping through, you know, some of those things, you know, hospital-based consultations, as we talked about before, you know, those have been used for years. It started with the telepsychiatry, but um, it's very common to see tele-intensive care arrangements. It's very common to see teleradiology is probably the poster child of, you know, virtual medicine, um, telestroke, and, and things of that nature. Um, and I and I think direct-to-consumer type models are direct-to-patient. Uh, I don't mean to kind of mix those two terms, but um, I think those are going to be increasingly more popular and, and common as well. So not only is it going to be the patient wants to be able to have the service at the hospital, they're going to want that patient at the home um, or if they're in the parking lot at a, a grocery store and they need to see their doctor, they want to be able to use a digital platform to do that. Um, so I think leveraging technology, you know, increased access to applications through phones, computers and things of that nature is going to just continue to increase both, both of those delivery models. Um, you know, I think, you know, the hospital based consult consultation services, um, I, I would say their limitations and requirements are uh, more similar than different to just the standard practice of medicine. Um, you know, you're going to have licensing and credentialing issues. Um, if you are a provider that works on the border between two states or four states, you know, the four corners regions, you, you know, you're going to need to be licensed in all those states. Um, the standard of care, which I think is always an interesting one. And I think, you know, people had always assumed that it's a different standard of care. Um, it's very much so the same standard of care based on my understandings. I mean, Dr. Sahani, I'll let you speak to that a little bit more because you're the provider on the on the phone, but it's more of a tool than a change. Um, is there anything different from, from your perspective related to how you approach seeing a patient virtually um, versus in person? No, Chris, uh, you're 100% you're, you're right. As you mentioned earlier, uh, our approach to this is just a change in modality, how we're delivering care, as you said earlier. Uh, and, and you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's just a different tool um, that, that, that now we have, or which, which perhaps we, all, we always had, but this COVID has given it an impetus for us, for us to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, I, I think as far as nephrology specifically is concerned, it, it has been a late adopter to uh, uh, telehealth. Uh, and I think mainly because of the inability to get um, on dialysis on site. When I say on site, I mean in the hospitals. And at Telenef, we've, we've effectively, you know, uh, have, have been able to overcome that, ob that obstacle. And once that obstacle has, has been overcome, I think it's just exactly as if you were seeing a patient face to face. Yep. And the other ones that come to mind are, you know, pro professional liability malpractice issues, um, you know, making sure that your coverage actually covers you and your partners in delivering this care. I think that's a step people often forget um, or the policy isn't as clear, like it might mention telemedicine, but it's not as clear as if it's completely covered under your plan or not. So I think those are things to consider. Um, and this gets, the, you know, to the point earlier is from a contracting mechanism, you need to make sure you're compliant with, you know, the federal and state fraud and abuse laws, um, you know, start laws and, and things of that nature to make sure that those transactions are, you know, fair market value and, and fit within um, those requirements. 
Um, and then those, you know, the ones that always come up, and I think they come up in every practice, is the privacy and data security. You know, those aren't going away. If not, if anything, they're getting more complex and harder to um, adhere to. But you know, again, luckily because of this massive push due to COVID, I think um, there was the waiver period um, to help mitigate some of the risk associated with that. But even the platforms now are a lot better and working to make sure that they're compliant with those so that they can be players in the healthcare arena. Right. And then, you know, direct to consumer, you know, that's not really kind of the intent of our or direct to patient uh, of, of our discussions today, but I think it's important. You know, I think all of those bullets are still applicable. Um, you know, some of the, the additional ones are kind of how you're structured, you know, legally as an entity, um, you know, the corporate practice of medicine doctrine and standards, you know, vary state by state. So it's, it's very important that you're kind of engaging legal counsel early um, um, in the process so that you're setting up your business so that you can actually practice. Um, you know, I think my concern is in all this, rush and hurry is a lot of groups are forgetting to do that. Um, and they're just kind of going out wild, wild west and, um, and engaging in this activity with, and hoping to fix it later, which COVID might have given the waivers and the opportunity to do that, but really buttoning up, speaking with legal and compliance to make sure that your models um, and the way you're delivering care is legally appropriate. And Chris, there's also the, uh, the company I mean, if you take a look at One Medical, you know, they're providing actually services to the companies. Today, they provide service to over 8,000 companies today. Yep. So you got the consumer, you got the patients, you got the physicians as well. You're seeing companies starting to step up as well, saying we need to provide this care to our employees. Yep. And you're seeing that a lot in the behavioral health space. I mean, you're, you're seeing some of these new <clears throat> companies come up, and, and it's not just behavioral health, but... I mean, they're ready and active to be engaged in more of a PMPM basis, right? Patient management, they're willing, willing to take risk right. um, because there's the technology, they have the systems in place from an efficiency standpoint to monitor that um, and really be available to connect with patients if, if, if a patient misses a weigh-in or a patient misses... Um, you know, a consult, their, their care management team is on that patient to make sure that they're not missing it the next day. So it's really interesting. You're seeing, it's, you're, it's like, you're right, Ron, it's, it's touching every aspect of kind of the patient experience. Right. And we've, you know, been talking, you know, a lot of this pretty fluidly through the conversation, but um, you know, really starting to direct it towards, you know, telenephrology as a case study and, you know, why it's primed to be able to support rural communities. Um, you know, rural hospitals, you know, generally um, don't have access to the same, you know, care team and access to specialists, especially nephrologists, um, to be able to appropriately care for them. So what you find is those patients presenting to their own emergency room or already being diverted by the ambulance system um, to another place of care miles away from their home. Um, so, um, you know, I think telemedicine, and, and I think it's proven, and Dr. Sahani, I think you would agree, it can definitely be a technology to advance some of the supply and demand issues that we discussed earlier about, you know, lack of supply, not only coming out of graduate programs, but in the rural communities where you may have one or no nephrologist within 50 miles of you um, really get support to that community. Absolutely right, uh, Chris. So the, the, the scenario is that in the community, there is a dialysis unit, which serves about, you know, maybe 40, 50 patients uh, uh, in, in the community, but the hospital, whether it be a small community hospital or critical access hospital, does not have the ability to, to, or does not have an inpatient acute dialysis program. And therefore, if these patients, you know, need admission on, for, for actually a very low acuity um, medical reason, like a pneumonia or a foot infection, just because they don't have inpatient acute dialysis, then these patients have to be transferred or often diverted straight 
from the dialysis unit or from their home to a hospital, which is about 60, 90 uh, miles away. It's not only a burden for the patient, it's also a burden for the family. And also the post-acute care often happens far away from home just because you know, everyone's lost line of sight about uh, that patient. So just bringing in, in the hospital an acute dialysis program can have significant, significant you know, uh, uh, lateral and downstream benefits for the community. Yep. And Chris, we built a whole model based upon that at Telena. So yeah. You're absolutely right. With Dr. Sahani and that, um, we're actually solving, you know, we're part of that rural health movement, you know, keeping care local. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's, and it gets, for me, I'm a big trends person. Um, looking at what the behavior is, I mean, Medicare, I mean, and the government has identified this base of patients as kind of the first ones, not the first, you know, I think behavioral health is definitely on that as well, but every trend you're seeing each year, kind of new reimbursement comes out from the government or, or activity um, from, from Congress related to kind of pushing forward initiatives to serve this community. Nephrology is usually on the table. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. It's they're high cost patients. So it's in everyone's best interest, not only to give the best care to the patient, but also really figure out how we can decrease the spend to keep those patients healthy and off of dialysis, right? So education, you know, you know these, these telemedicine programs can serve a lot of, wear a lot of hats and serve the community in a lot of different ways. Um, it might start with being able to treat the patient in the hospital. And, you know, Dr. Tani, I know we're gonna get into it later, but, you know, really being an engaged member into the community you know, not just an individual, but the, the group of providers providing services there, getting engaged in the community. Um, it, it, it can open the door to education. Um, it opened the door to a lot of different avenues to really improve the health care of a community. Chris, I know we're, um, we have what, about 15 more minutes, is that right? Yep. Okay, I just want to make um, sure we're on time and things like that. You know, based upon the great conversations we've been having here, right, it's, it's not about the technology, right? It's, it's about what we we're talking about, the quality of care, right? And it seems that, you know, healthcare has been late to the game. And if you focus, you know, when they actually started getting in, it's when everybody was getting money for EHRs back in 2008. And finally, you had like what you were talking about, Chris, you're getting data, you're able to take a look at clinical data with claim data. You're able to help with population health. You're being able to deliver, you know, the quality of care down to the individual level. And, but if you look at what the VA has been doing, you know, they've been doing it since 2003. And you even talked about it earlier, you know, back in the 60s and the 70s and things like that. It's not new. And it's interesting that, you know, healthcare is the industry that talks about technology like it's a new frontier, where in reality it's been here forever. And in 2018, the VA actually, you know, did over 1 million consults um, and over 50% were in the rural market. And, you know, you focus on the rural market and you take a look at the population and you already asked, you know, Dr. Sahani, where he lives, he doesn't live in the rural area. He lives in an urban area. And the majority of all nephrologists live in the urban area, not in the rural area. But it's an older population. And as Dr. Sahani was saying about his patients, they have, you know, chronic diseases. It's just not one disease they're coming in. They have multiple diseases. Lower income, and one of the biggest issues they have is the lack of public transportation. You know, they're spread out, and the ability to get to the doctor is really hard as well on that. Um, we talk about the lack of technology in regards to usage and infrastructure in the rural area. But the one thing, Chris, that you brought up as well, what we talked about, the physician, the specialties are limited in the rural area. And this is where telehealth is a ideal solution for the rural market. Um, when we work with hospitals and we talk to them, I spent 11 years in Asia, so you get a little Sun Tzu from me here. Um, but know the population you're serving. And what we sit down with the CEO, the CFO, or the chief clinical officer of the hospital is, 
what's the demographics of the disease state in your community, in your county, and things like that? What are, what's being offered? And like what Dr. Sahani was talking about, there's dialysis units within the community, but the local hospital might not have that dialysis uh, available at their hospital. And then the patient has to drive 60 or 90 miles away to get care, where in reality, they could get care locally. And, and that's the focus. And we sit down with them and take a look at the lost opportunities. Not only a lost opportunity from the hospital, but the lost opportunity from the community, you know, their future patients and things like that. Keep them local, deliver care local. That's, that's the mission of their hospitals in the rural community. And Chris, you have already talked about, you know, the legal, the compliance considerations and things like that. But the biggest thing that we do with the hospitals in the rural market is help them understand the business case. What's the return on investment if you do this? And then what's the operational considerations? Because you touched on it as well, Chris. I mean, do they have the skill sets? Do they have the competencies and things like that? And Dr. Sahani, I know that within a critical access hospital, you want to make sure that they have the ICU capability as well, correct? That's right. Uh, that, 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 Ron, uh, that actually is, is helpful uh, as, you, as you, you start to launch the program. But as we, we develop a, a good comfort level, uh, you know, trying to deliver this care remotely between the hospital and us, I think the need for having an ICU sort of wanes. However, if this, if this allows a hospital to, to, to sort of uh, open an ICU or develop an ICU, then down the road it's only going to help the hospital as well. Right. And, you know, know thyself, you know, the typical, you know, Sun Tzu, making sure that you understand, you know, the, your staff and their capabilities and things like that. And then what we do is uh, create, you know, what's the financial impact? And not only is it a financial impact, but it's also, you know, communicating out to the marketplace as well. Communicating to the dialysis centers, communicating it to the physicians that they're seeing today and letting them know that they can get care if they have an emergency, that they can go to their local, local hospital. This one, you gotta, you gotta touch a lot. <laughs> so chronic kidney disease, and I'm gonna talk about it, but I'm gonna let Dr. Sahani, who's a nephrologist, talk probably about more about it. But how big is chronic kidney disease? Well, 11% of the population in the United States over 37 million people have chronic kidney disease. 2% of those people have end-stage renal dialysis. End-stage renal dialysis means they're actually getting dialysis at a facility, a DeVita, Fresenius, or DCI, or somebody else like that. But what's interesting, 50% of those people are 65 years and older. And the average that an ESRD patient goes to the hospital is twice a year. Now, they're not going from a standpoint all the time that it's kidney related. They could fracture their femur. They could, you know, have another emergency and things like that as well. But this is the statistic that I think, Chris, that you were talking about, the opportunity to focus on the population health aspect. 90% of the people that have CKD don't know they have it, right? And this is where you were talking about where you can bring in the education and doing the outreach. And this is like, especially in the rural area, that if the more they actually have outreach, the better they'll be able to keep their population healthy. And you've already touched on this as well. There's fewer nephrologists graduating, but the volume's increasing. And you know, the doctors aren't moving out to the rural area. Dr. Sahani, I know you got, you live this every day. Absolutely, but, but, but these numbers, are, you know, they, 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 they tell a very, very good story. And these, this is, these, Numbers are, are right on. Uh, just imagine you, you're not having, and, and I see this quite often, uh, you're, not have, you, you're having kidney disease, you don't know it. The only time you know it is when you're a few months away from dialysis. Just, just imagine the, the, the uh, psychological impact that can have on, on yourself and also indirectly on your chronic kidney disease. So, so these numbers are staggering. I think, uh, uh, like you mentioned, Ron, uh, uh, telenephrology is through education, through uh, s service on site, uh, through building the community, I, I think it will have a tremendous, tremendous help and impact. 
Yeah, because I mean, you get back to understanding rural communities is one, not only is the hospital a major resource, you know, for the economic viability of the, the organization, but once you start to get, you know, that interaction with folks like yourself, Dr. Sahani, and the nursing staff and the medical staff at the hospital, not only does it treat the patient for that incident of care, but it starts to educate that staff. So when they're going out into the community, they're more aware that this exists and, and opportunities exist to, to really improve the awareness of this disease state. Yeah, you know, excellent, excellent point uh, there, there, Christian. And not only is, is the opportunity increased to spread the awareness, but once, as we noticed when we started our program, uh, nurses who we initially we thought were not either, either not interested or did not know much about the physiology of of uh, of CKD and of physiology of dialysis, all of a sudden developed an interest. And so, for the hospital, it, it also helps increase their talent pool. And not, not only increase, but also retain their talent pool. Right now, you know, the rural hospitals, about 25% of them are in financial distress. I just was listening to uh, Brock Slobach from the National Rural Hospital Association. And he said there's 453 hospitals that are at risk of closure. And that's in regards to having cash flow for 33 days. So there's an opportunity for them to actually offer new service lines and keep them more financially stable. Their options today, you know, when they're in this position, do they cut costs or do they offer a new service line? There's another, you know, opportunity as well that's not on here. And, and you see it sometimes is where they actually build relationships with big health systems in the cities or in other urban areas and things like that. But the new service line that they can offer, you can either partner or do it alone. At, you know, at Telnef, we're actually partnering with them that they can bring this service out to their community and live their mission of delivering service locally. Dr. Sahani, I know what you're doing out in Arizona. I think it's a great case, the Critical Access Hospital. I think you've seen in the last year, what, about 100 uh, patients already? More, more actually. Yeah, in the last year, about 100, but in the last two years, definitely, definitely more. The, uh, the, the acceptance in the community was instantaneous because uh, that particular community has always been asking for, for inpatient dialysis, you know, for, for a good reason, because they have outpatient dialysis in the community. The, I just want to add quickly, as soon as, or as the hospital introduced this service line, they were able to get open other service lines, including um, cardiology, general surgery, and even orthopedics. So just by introducing uh, telenephrology and having dialysis on site, they were able to see their bottom line improve and offer more uh, services to the community. So this is one of the business cases that we actually sit down with the hospital CEO, CFO, or chief clinical officer. We actually take the you know, within the community, how many ESRD patients are in that community. And based upon if it's a non-critical access hospital and they're utilizing DRGs, we work with their numbers and that and determine, you know, what the revenue potential is. As you can see, as the net revenue to the hospital, it's over six figures. And as Dr. Sahani was mentioning as well, that does not include the revenue potential from labs, from pharma, or even the case mix index. So by offering a new service line, you know, not only do you make the hospital more stable, you're living their mission from the standpoint of delivering care locally, but as Dr. Sahani stated as well, they're bringing now new service lines into that community. Here, here's the point that you know, we, we stress as well. What we're not doing is we're not competing against the dialysis center. We're not competing against the patient's existing provider, but what we're allowing is the hospitals to admit ESRD patients that before were either being transferred out or driving 60 or 90 miles out to the next county. So that's that individual, but then their loved ones as well were also driving because they felt guilty or that, you know, they wanted to go see them. 
And, you know, that's a burden on the individuals. And today you can get this service right within your community. Dr. Sahani is doing it right now in Arizona. And, you know, storms, winter, or anything else like that of driving, you've eliminated that. They're going right now to the community. And I think that's the biggest thing right now with the movement that's going on in regards to the focus of rural health, keeping the patients local and they're getting their care from their local neighbors. Keep it local is what we say. Dr. Sani, you want to throw anything more out? No, you've, you've signed it up really well, uh, Ron. Uh, keep it local. I, right. We'll hardly agree. And, you know, I think, again, it gets back to that kind of holistic message of, like, telemedicine isn't, you know, a threatening aspect coming in. You know, for the community provider, it, it should be viewed as a support system. You know, these, 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 these models are created to allow a day off of call, right? Dr. Hani, you know, the burden of the beeper is heavier and heavier every year, especially for nephrologists. Um, and in rural communities, having to be on call every night, um, can be taxing. Um, so it's kind of a non-threatening way to get care into the community. Yep, that's absolutely right. And Chris, I want to thank you for allowing us to be part of your uh, panel session. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you both and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.